welcome to everybody for attending our uh, webinar today on, on OpenTree. It's our end of year webinar and we've had a really good turnout today. So it's encouraging to see uh, the large number of attendees on this webinar today. Um, just before we start, a quick introduction. Uh, my name's Gary Edwards and I'm the head of UK sales for OpenTree. I've actually been with Grey Tech for over 12 years now. Um, and since the acquisition that we did in, in January, I now head up this part to the business. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Daniel Taylor North, who was part of the original Open Tree team and has seen the product from inception to, to where it is today. But he is also in charge of, of developing this product to meet our customer requirements. So for those of you that don't know Grey Tech, just a couple of quick slides because it's important to understand us as a business. We are an Autodesk Platinum partner. We're actually the third largest in the world today with over 48 offices and we're growing. We're on an acquisitive trail to, to purchase more IP. Just a quick snapshot of our coverage across uh, Europe, uh, but we're also in, in North America and Canada. And when you look at our business today, whilst Autodesk is the backbone to what we do, our business is very focused on value add with our own IP, whether that's helping customers to design better projects, simulate them in the real world, taking the deliverables through to fabrication and, and site delivery. We understand the supply chain. Overarching the entire process is drawing and document management, which is what we'll be discussing today. So OpenTree, well in a nutshell, OpenTree is a BIM compliant drawing and document management solution for architects and engineers, helping you to adopt a consistent approach and automate where we see the non-billable activity. I won't dwell on these slides too much because I think they're quite self-explanatory, but we can see demand is, is changing and, and we can certainly see projects are becoming more complex. When you look at the technology trends, we even are hearing things about self-healing concrete. But if we take data, data is, is an important trend that we cannot ignore. Arguably, we're in the fourth industrial revolution, the data era. And, and certainly what we've seen is the better that we can get with our information at the front end, the more we can do with it downstream, the more value we can bring into our business because we're helping to maximize efficiency. And, and that's one of the key takeaways for today. It's about helping you to become more efficient. The company itself, so we acquired OpenTree in January this year, uh, but the product cabinet was formed in 2003. And at the time integrated with AutoCAD LT, AutoCAD, Revit, Bentley MicroStation and the MS Office Suites. Um, it's all about implementing standards. We have rebranded this year in June from Cabinet to OpenTree. So we've standardized on, on OpenTree as the name for our drawing and document control. Um, but really, when we look at this product, it's all about helping our customers. As I mentioned in the previous slide, it's our own IP which we control helping you to be more efficient and manage your drawings and documents. Some names there that are already using OpenTree today from architects such as Purcells, Whitton Cox, in the rail industry with Atkins, Siemens, uh, even in the utilities with Sellafields and, and, and councils. There's, there's some really strong names that are using OpenTree to manage their drawings and documents. Now, I've broken this down slightly into to four personas. Uh, and then I'll shortly be passing you over to Daniel to, to see the product in action. But it's important to understand, you know, where OpenTree fits with regards to the different personas within the business and, and what value that we can bring to each of those. Now, these are common challenges every business faces today and, and our top level objectives, turnover, reputation, innovation. Uh, but if we take profitability, when I go and speak to customers today um, and, and we tap into, you know, what makes their businesses tick, uh, inevitably, you know, profitability is sanity. So how do we maximize that? Do we have a brand name where we can charge more? 
maybe like Rolex. But if we don't have that, then we have to look within our four walls and, and look at our current processes today and see where possible can we automate those pro those processes, thus becoming more efficient and maximising the margins on, on projects or products. Um, for the IT, you know, this is a really nice fit for, for, for IT personnel because we often hear that they have a fear of data becoming locked. And we have seen that with, with certain applications in the market today that will either encrypt your data or make it very difficult for your, um, your get out plan should you need to get that data out. And Daniel will talk with OpenTree how easy it is to, to get access to your own IP. Um, also, one of the hot topics uh, or the hot word today is, is integrations. Everybody in industry is looking at workflows from one product to another. And with OpenTree and, and its backbone with SQL, it's very easy for us to, to find information that may already be on your systems and pull that into, into OpenTree. Security, always been a, a topic for a while, and we can bring in password protected processes. Um, and, and really, we're trying to alleviate some of that heavy reliance on IT and give control maybe back to um, administration where they can start to control some of the users and permissions and things like that. For us, BIM is, is a hot topic and, and I just want to add, you know, whilst today we do have an emphasis on, on BIM and, and the ISO 19650 standard, this application is, is very much appropriate to different industries that need to manage documents in, in any standards or, or creating any deliverable, but we will have an emphasis obviously on, on BIM today. And when you look at the industry, there is a lot of information to, to take on board from the employer's information requirements, the BIM execution plans, understanding the ISO 19650, and, and if you've read through the, the, the thick documents there, you'll know there's a lot there. Not only that, we've, we've got to train our workforce you know, if we have to comply to a BIM level two project and we're following the ISO standard, you know, how do we uh, get everybody to adopt the same consistent file naming approach or understanding what status codes we're using for collaboration? Uh, template management, we often see that you want to make decisions on, on the latest approved information. How, wo how well do you have visibility on what the latest revision is? And we often see a heavy reliance on spreadsheets, um, you know, taking the, the, the issue sheet or the drawing register as, as an example of that. Now, for those that are familiar uh, with the employer's information requirements, you will see a section in there that, that outlines what the data exchange formats will be. And typically here we, we do see PDFs, we see the natives, we see the DWGs or the IFCs. Um, and, and the question really is, how long does it take you to create these? And then you make a change and then you've got to reissue and, and, and resave as. This is quite a big time constraint from when we're talking to our customers, whether they're doing it manually on the client's PC. And as you know, if you're printing to PDF manually, you know, that, that takes up your machine. So can you be getting on with other tasks? And for us within OpenTree, it's all about how we set the projects up for you to be able to automate these deliverables. Um, and if you're uploading these into the common data environments, then again, Daniel will show later on in the presentation how we can automate the upload into BIM 360, Viewpoint for Projects, A-Site, A-Connects, Business Collaborator, um, and our most recent, we've now done the SharePoint integration. So whether you're using SharePoint as your internal CDE, we can now upload the latest approved information that meets your standard directly into your own SharePoint environment so people can get access to the latest information. For those that are familiar, the file name into the ISO 19650 standards. Um, and as you can see, that, that there's quite a lot there to, to get right. Um, and if any of you have had the experience of uploading the information to the common data environments and then maybe seeing a rejection because you've missed something or you've not filled out something quite right, that again takes time. Time that we, we deem non-billable because it's uh, administrative tasks that we have to do. Um, but if we can automate this for you, if we can lead users by the hand, so enabling them to focus on what they're good at, creating content, 
then that's going to be a benefit because we're helping you to be more efficient and we're helping you to be compliant. And Daniel will demonstrate that shortly. So for the end users, really, like I just said in the previous slide, it's helping you to maximize your time focused on what you're there to deliver content. Um, we want to try and reduce the time that you spend on searching for drawings and documents. And we know that this is a, a, a big time constraint for most organizations today uh, when it comes to, to searching on the information, because it may be on your local machine, machine, it may be up in Dropbox, or it may be on an external hard drive somewhere. And when we see that, it becomes difficult searching for the information. Um, another thing that we also see is, is that we have multiple uncontrolled copies and I even put my hand up to that, you know, uh, when I create PowerPoint presentations, I have about 10 different versions of the same thing. But for someone outside coming in, if they were to look at that, it would be a bit of a mess for them. I understand it, but it's not scalable as we bring new people into the organization. So. As I summarize, uh, we know traditional processes work, but as I mentioned, they're not scalable. We do see uh, what we call non-billable activity. And really with OpenTree, we're helping organizations to reduce that, maximize their profit margins. And when projects are becoming more complex today, it's becoming ever so important to get it right at the front end stage. Um, we're seeing demands for information earlier on in the project. Um, and, and one of the things that we, we talk a lot about to our customers is certification or accreditation. You know, how well can you do your audits? How well can you show the evidence that, okay, we have a process, we've documented it. How well can you quickly get that information to show the evidence? And within OpenTree, we've got really robust auditing tools. So we're helping organizations to have this, what we call single source, not not necessarily single source in its outright, because we appreciate we still have to have flexibility, but the more we can bring into this central location, the quicker we can search on it, the better we can manage it and, and reap those ROI benefits. We're helping you to automate your processes, reduce manual errors, better auditing controls. And if you are thinking of taking the, the ISO 19650 certification, this is a big tick in the box because you're showing evidence of managing your process and you're using software to help reduce some of those manual errors that we typically see on uh, traditional um, personal processes. So hopefully that sets the scene for you. Um, I'm now going to pass you over to my colleague Daniel uh, who will be doing a demo. Um, there's three words really that I want everybody to, to take away um, after this demonstration and, and that's really compliance, visibility and efficiency. Because we have built in ISO 19650 file naming, you know, we help organizations to be compliant to a BIM level two project. It doesn't have to be that standard. Effectively, we can configure any standard. Um, but what this enables every organization is to get better, better visibility on what's going on. Almost like the who, the what, the why, the when. Not necessarily the big brother, but in times of dispute, if you need to quickly get access to X, Y, and Z, it's already there within OpenTree. And really what we're trying to do is help our customers to become more efficient. Um, whether we can save an hour a week, um, three hours a month, whatever it may be, you know, you times that by the amount of people in the organization and you'll be quite surprised at the numbers on the back end. So in the demonstration, we've broken it down into to four digestible uh, chunks. Firstly, we'll, we'll show you how you, how you set up a, a, a project, um, looking at a bit of the SQL backgrounds uh, alike. Um, how we can adopt a consistent approach. So we'll use AutoCAD as the example, and we'll just quickly pull in some of the, the property info, the file name in, looking at the status codes. We'll then move on to Revit, uh, for all of those that are using Revit and want to manage Revit sheets, looking at review and approval process and how we can do revision control. 
Um, and then finally, Daniel will show um, uploading, not, not only automating the deliverables, but then uploading those deliverables into the common data environments. And for the purpose of today, we will focus on, on BIM 360, uh, and Daniel will also show uh, a quick upload into SharePoint as well. So, Daniel, I will make you presenter. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, all good. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to see on your screen now the OpenTree Explorer software. And as you can see, it looks like classic Windows Explorer, which of course is by design, because who gets trained how to use Windows Explorer? Um, like Windows Explorer, we have folders down the left-hand side, and we have files on the right-hand side. Now, the folder structure itself, we can ship with this folder structure that you see, um, and it's a good starting point for everybody. If you have your own folder structure that you have used for the last five years and you want to continue to use, then obviously we will import that folder structure, and your users will then see their folder structure as they're used to it for the last five years, and they'll be able to pick up the software, hopefully, very quickly. Um, on the right hand side, instead of seeing things like date modified and file size in the columns, you see metadata that's relevant to the type of documents you're currently working with. So if I was working with emails, for example, I might see from, to, sent, cc, etc. If I was working with photographs, I might see date time taken or location, GPS location, those kind of things. But I'll just expand this screen. As you can see, with the reports folder that I'm currently in, we have things like version, description, intent, stage, and so on. Now, just to explain this, the concept of checking in and checking out, whilst it's black, that document is checked in. It's on the file server, available for anybody to work with. Once I open the document, it will turn blue because it's checked out to me. I'm currently working on that document. Red means that somebody else is currently working on that document, so it's checked out to somebody else. I can always preview a read-only copy of what it last looked like when it was checked in, but I can't see their current edits. So, once the user has navigated into the folder structure, they can simply right-click in a folder, New, Document, and it takes them to these little green arrows. Now, these little green arrows are called intents, and the first thing that these intents do is drive the user to the latest approved template. Now, this isn't a template that's been on somebody's C drive for the last three years and the address has changed once and the logo has changed. This is the latest approved template. So people don't have to spend time looking for the latest approved template or asking a colleague if that's their latest template. The templates themselves are documents within the system. They go through their own approval and release cycle. So as they get released, they're updated throughout the system wherever that template is configured to be used. So, they drive me to the latest template. The second thing they do is they provide me with free metadata because people hate filling metadata or keywords. And also, we don't really want them filling in the word environmental because someone's going to miss out the end, someone's going to put env dot, and then when we come to search on that in the future, we'll only find half the documents just due to misspellings or abbreviations. The third thing they do is they allow us to have a much flatter fold structure. As you'll notice, I don't have, under the word reports down here on the folders, I don't have an environmental folder or risk assessment folder or safety folder. So what this is doing is allowing us to have a much flatter fold structure. So in three years time, I'm not navigating a folder structure, clicking on folders thinking, well, nothing in here, nothing in here, nothing in here, because we can search and filter on these green arrows within our folder we don't need to have such a deep fold structure. Another thing that they're doing is ensuring that I'm creating the right documents in the right folder. So I can only create reports in this folder. I can only import reports into this folder. I can't create a calculation, for example, or I wouldn't be able to import a photograph and vice versa. I wouldn't be able to create a report in my photographs folder. So we're encouraging and actually driving the users to create the right kinds of documents in the right folders. 
So again, in three years' time, you're not navigating through a folder structure thinking, well, this is where I would have put it, because that's where it will be. It's the only place they could have put it. Once you've selected the template, they also drive what metadata we're going to capture. So if we had a little green arrow that said minutes of meeting, it may drive the fact that we want to capture the meeting room or the next meeting date. So we're ensuring that we're only showing the user or prompting the user for relevant information. But before we create a document, the first thing we need to do is create ourselves a new project. Now in Windows, you probably already have a template folder structure, which you copy and paste every time you wish to create a new project. In fact, you may have several large projects, small projects, different types of project structures for different disciplines. And obviously you can have the same within inside of OpenTree. And again, these are not just dumb folders like they would be in Windows. These are all pre-configured with those little green arrows. So when a user goes to create a document in the folder, they're prompted to create the right kinds of documents in the right folders. They're prompted with the latest approved template. It's also going to drive the naming convention that we're going to use. So if you have a client folder structure and they have a client naming convention, which is different to the ISO standard, then you can configure that into that environment. And that means for that project, the system will automate your client's numbering system. But when you work inside your BIM ISO 19650 compliant project, it will use the ISO 19650 naming convention. It's also going to drive what workflows our documents go through. So a letter might go through a very simple self-approval workflow, where a drawing sheet might go through a very complex drawing issue workflow. Also, who's involved within those workflows? Who are the checkers? Who are the approvers? All these things can be pre-configured into your template. Permissions can also be pre-configured. So if you have a finance folder and you don't want everybody going into that folder, then obviously you'd have a finance group and the relevant people would be in that group. But it also means that we can prevent people from just randomly creating folders because not everyone will have permission to do so. So you won't end up with folders called Dave's stuff where Dave keeps all his stuff regardless of what everyone else is doing. Okay, we're going to ensure that we're using a standard fold structure across all our projects. Now, within the root of our project, you'll also note I have a project summary file because we say that every project should have a project summary file. So we put it in the root and you can do that in Windows, obviously, but it obviously would have to have a common name. But here, what I'm going to do is right click like you would in Windows, copy. You go to where your projects are. Mine happen to be in the root, but yours may be deeper in your structure. Hit paste. Now, it doesn't have to auto number, but it can. You can obviously call your projects whatever you like. If you are using auto numbering, then it can also contribute to your file name prefix. So what we're saying here is any document, drawing, model that we create under our structure, we want it prefixed with 003 and then OPE for OpenTree. So we hit next. We're going to include documents because we want that project summary and hit next again. Now, not only can documents have keywords, but folders can have keywords. And if you have a folder that represents your project, you now have project keywords. But it may be the case that you have a PIM system, a project information management system, where you have already entered all this information when you were bidding or tendering for the job. Now, if that system is SQL based, we can simply query that database and pull the fact that it's Glasgow Airport runway extension out of that SQL database and put the information into our OpenTree product. Again, if you have an SQL based CRM system, we can connect to that as well and pull the DNV consulting based in Aberdeen and place that information into our project information. Now, not all projects are gonna be uploading into common data environments, but for those that are, we can link our project to a common data environment. And as you can see, we've got AConnect, A Site, BIM360, Group BC, SharePoint, Viewpoint for Projects. And as mentioned, we're going to use BIM360. You've then got to choose a location because you may have many clients using BIM360. So you've got to choose which installation of BIM360 you're connecting to. And also what files do you want to upload? The attached file is the PDF, the IFC file, for example, whereas the native file would be the DWG file, the Word document, the Revit model, for example. So we want the attached, the output file to be uploaded. So we hit finish. 
That creates a new project. You can see the information is along the top there. So Glasgow Airport and DNV Consulting. And when we navigate into that project, you'll see that it's automatically named my project summary to be 003 because it knows where it lives. It can automatically name this file. And when I open this file, it checks it out. So it turns it blue, takes a local copy to my machine and then launches it into the relevant application, in this case, Word. But then it runs a process we call IDL, Intelligent Data Linking. So what it's done is taking that information that we've sucked from our third party SQL based systems and populated it straight into the body of our project summary file. It's also filled in the footer information with the reference number that it automatically generated. So we can automatically pot populate heads and footers or the body of your Word and Office documents. Now, if I were to copy and paste this file to another project and then open that file, it would obviously, first of all, rename it to 001 because it now lives in project one, for example. And then when I opened it, it would automatically run the IDL again and repopulate the body of my Word document and my footer information. So the idea here is that if you're copying and pasting documents because nobody starts from scratch on every document, what you don't want is to, for example, copy a drawing and then paste it into a new project to change the content, forget to change the title block information for the project address, for example. So there's somebody out on site looking at a piece of paper thinking, well, that's the building, but that's not the address. OK, that's all automated because the system knows where your documents live and it takes the relevant information and updates it on open of your documents. And if we were to show the creation of a AutoCAD file, we go into CAD, drawing rendition. We can come into here now and say right click, new document. This time we've only got the one border. We can't use any other border. That's the only one we're allowed to use within this folder. You could have multiple, like we had multiple report templates, but we've got the one here, hit next. Then it's gonna prompt us to fill this information in. These little red arrows mean they're mandatory. And you see, I can't continue until I fill this information in. And you can configure what information you wish to capture and also which pieces of information are mandatory. Now we've just configured this with the standard. So all the entries in here come straight out of the standard. But again, you can reconfigure these and add and remove, etc. We've defaulted to architect in this case, but you could select another one. And this is my drawing. So hit next. Chris, me, my. ISO compliant naming convention, as you can see, and it's named that from the folder structure, the three bits of keyword information we filled in, but also the intent, the little green arrow. So it's a combination of where you are in the structure, the type of document you're creating, and also any additional metadata. But if your folder structure is broken down into your naming convention codes, then we can get all the information just from your folder structure, and we wouldn't need anything else to generate our naming convention. But it's a mixture of those three things. Depends on how much flexibility you want to give your users. You'll also notice that it's giving it PO101, so it's automatically versioned it, and it's giving it a status of S0. So it's automated the versioning, the status, and the naming convention. But me as a user, I haven't been trained how to follow that standard. It's been automate just by me selecting English terms through the keywords, navigating a folder structure, and I'm not to really understand what all those codes mean. But as you can see, it's used the IDL process again, and it's populated my drawing number, my status, my revision, my purpose of initial status, but it's also put in the date in there, put in my drawing, and it's also put DMV consulting from Glasgow Airport because we're working in project three, and that's the information we pulled from our SQL based systems. So we can automatically populate title blocks of your AutoCAD files as well. So just to recap where we are at the moment, what we've done is we've ensured that we are using a standard and standard across all our projects folder structure. People can't just create Dave stuff folders willy nilly everywhere. We're ensuring that people are creating the right kinds of documents in the right folders. We're ensuring that people are using the correct latest approved template. We're ensuring we're capturing all the relevant metadata. 
we're automating the naming convention for the user and the versioning and the status. We're automating the population of the bodies of the Office documents, the population of your title blocks. So we're trying to take away all that administration work, all that training that's required. We don't want everybody to be trained to BIM manager level just to understand how they implement the naming convention. As you can see, they selected English terms and eventually we can list those along the side as well. So eventually people will pick up the fact that O1 must be volume system O1 and A is architect. And if we just expand this column here, basement level two must be B2. So they start to pick up what the codes mean, but they don't need to from the very start. It's not read this manual before you can start creating your files. So now we've established the automation that we've done so far and ensuring that people are always using all the latest information, we're going to create ourselves a Revit project. So what I'm going to do here is navigate into the 3D model folder and then right click in here and say new document. Again, it's just giving me the one. I've just got the one that comes free with Revit for now, but obviously you may have many different versions of Revit templates and also versions of Revit itself. So if you're running Revit 2018, Revit 2019 and 2020 on your machine, then because you'll have selected a relevant template through this interface here, we know what version of Revit that is. Therefore, it means that we can automatically launch the correct version of Revit when you double click that file. So there's no more automatically upgrading your projects when you open up a Revit 2016 in 2018. Okay, so that prevents that from happening. So we create our Revit model again, following the ISO standard, but you'll notice this didn't get assigned a version and it didn't get assigned a status. That's because the models in this configuration live forever. It's only at the point when we snapshot them that we assign them a version and a status but this itself is living forever. Now, you'll have to imagine that I'm the chief engineer or lead architect, I'm the person who's going to set up the central model file. So I've created myself a new Revit project and it's been named automatically for me, so then I can open it. But unlike the Word documents or the AutoCAD files when I open it and it checks it out locally to my machine for me, so that I can work on it and edit it and then when I check it back in, it puts it on the server for me. Unlike that, with Revit, it knows that what I'm trying to do at this point is create a central model file. Therefore, it can't copy the file locally. What it's got to do is open it directly off the file server because when we create this as a collaborative central model, it's gonna write its path into itself and therefore we have to do that in place. But before we do so, I just want to show that it says DNV Consulting Glasgow Airport in the bottom right corner. So an open of Revit, we're pulling that information into the parameters of our Revit project, and we can obviously place those onto our sheet. But we don't get in the way of how Revit works. This is now, now normal Revit functionality. So for those who've set up central model files, you recognize everything that I'm doing here. And this is nothing to do with us or OpenTree. This is just standard Revit functionality. So I'm creating this as a central model file. But OpenTree has allowed you to ensure that it's in the state ready to be created a central model file. You can see that it's saving as a central model, so yes. So now as the chief engineer lead architect, I might create some sheets, I might um, do some other work in order of preparing this ready for my team to work on. But for now, all I wanted to do was make it a central model file, so we'll close that. So as the lead architect, chief engineer, I check in the file. And now I wanna make this ready for my users to use so they can all get working copies of it. So all I do is workflow, start project. And what this does is change the stage to work in progress. Now this work in progress, I don't get open anymore, but we all do get open working copy. And when I click open working copy, it doesn't turn it blue. It doesn't check out the file. What it does, it takes a copy of that central model file, inserts just before the .rvt, either the user's username or email address, depending on how you license your Autodesk products, and brings it locally to my local work area, and then launches it into the correct version of Revit. As you can see, mine is tsa.admin, so it's inserted the name just before the RVT. So I've now got my own 
working copy of this Revit project, which I could go and centralize back, sorry, synchronize back to the central model anytime I liked. And if we just jump back to OpenTree, you'll see that it's not blue, which means all my team can get a working copy and everyone can synchronize back to the central model. But now we're in our local copy of the Revit model in the correct version of Revit. Although it's filled in the project information, what we haven't got is any sheet information. That's where our add-ins come in. So what we can do is we can say assign sheets. I've only got the one at the moment. So if you're provided with a Revit model with lots of sheets in that you need to then reassign sheet numbers to, this is how you do that. So you say import. You may have different types of sheets. I've just got the one. Again, we can give it a volume and a level. And we'll give the description of existing site. Hit next. And you can see it's going to generate this number for us automatically. So if I move my hand away from the mouse, not that you can tell, you have to believe me, um, it then fills in the title block with the existing site. It's put the date in, it's got my initials, it knows who I am. But it's also filled in the drawing number, the status, revision, and the purpose automatically. To create new sheets, we say create sheets, we pick our title block, hit OK. Again, we go to import. Again, we pick what sheet type it is, volume you want to create for your new sheets, what level you want them. And then in here I can say proposed site. We hit next. We actually want two of these. Next. So it's going to create me sheets two and three. Finish. Again, move my hand away from the mouse. What this will do is generate us two new sheets and it'll leave us in the last one. And you'll see that the title block is automatically populated with sheet three and all the relevant information. Now, once we've done our drawing composition, our detailing, etc., we need to get these sheets through our own internal check and approval workflow. So what we need to do is export these sheets out of Revit in order to do so. And all we do is select the files. Now we can export them directly to PDF and it would place the PDF output directly into OpenTree, which we could then pass through a workflow. However, in this case, we're going to export them as DWG files. And there's two reasons for that. First one is we have to uh, provide our supplier with a DWG, for example. And the second one is that we can automate the DWG. So we can automate the title block. We can update it as it passes through our workflow. And our engine, our workflow engine, is going to also automatically generate PDFs anyway. So we'll end up with both. Now, it's also noticed that there are some raster images again, attached to one of these sheets. So we've got to put those into our system so that as if the DWGs pass through our workflow engine, it can automatically resolve the XREFs back to the raster images because Revit doesn't um, merge or flatten the raster images into the DWG exports. So again, it's taking care of that as well uh, for those that have that issue. So if we just minimize our local copy of Revit, and come back into here and go to our two model td 2d model folder you'll now see that we have three sheets all exported out of revit and the vault p01 s0 status and once we're ready we need to send these through our check and approval process and to do that all we need to do is workflow send for checking now you'll notice i have direct approval as well that's because the system is trying to lead the user by the hand. They can only ever do the right action at the right time. But it also knows who I am. So it might be that most of my team just see send for checking. But me as the lead architect or chief engineer, I also see direct approval because let's say it's uh, four o'clock on a Friday and everyone else has gone home and we need to get the sheets out. Then I can do that. So we just step through here. I can leave a note and say, please check the roof as it may fall off okay next and we get a list of uh, checkers you can see Richard reviewer is there and that's because that's their role their checkers but it's also relevant to the project we're currently in so we can have different people for different projects they can be pre-ticked and it always sent to those people and you never see the screen or you can tick people. And if you multi-tick people, it can be a first come, first served basis or everybody has to approve it before it moves forward basis. 
but I'm going to send it to myself just so I don't have to log in and out of Windows several times in order to do this demo. But you'll notice it says the word pending on the end. Now, the reason it says pending is because what we've just done by putting that through the workflow is submit a job to our back-end workflow box. Now, our back-end workflow box, you can think of as an unmanned machine and a printer. A printer in the fact that it's got a queue and it outputs something. But on my machine, the fact it's got applications on that have been automated, it's doing certain tasks. So it's resolving the Xrefs back to the raster, for example. It's updating the title block automatically for me to say that this is now a checking copy rather than initial status copy. It's generating me a PDF as well automatically so that we can check and review the PDF rather than um, the actual DWG file itself. And it's also sending an email to the checker telling them they have some work to do. So, you'll now have to imagine I'm a checker, a different person, sat over a different desk, maybe a different office, doesn't really matter. And I receive an email. Now, I could follow this link and it'll take me straight to the document. There we are. Now, you don't, if I had been sent 300 files for checking, maybe the user did a search across multiple projects and selected 300 drawing sheets and sent them all to me for checking, in one go, you obviously don't get 300 emails, you get one email telling you about the 300. But all I need to do is follow the link, and I could preview it in AutoCAD, but you'll see I can't open or edit it, but I could preview it. And um, if I want to check it in AutoCAD, that's still fine, I'll print it out. But now we can just say review and send for approval. Because when it went through that workflow backend box, what it did is it generates a PDF. So now we can review using PDF markup tools. We can see the note that being been left for us, please check the roof as it may fall off. But more importantly, if we zoom in the bottom right corner, it says for checking. So if we do print this off and put it to next to the initial status copy on a desk, we know which one is the checking copy. Now I'm not going to mark it up, but obviously I could do and I could reject it and the person would get an email telling them it had been rejected. But I'm just going to say yes, looks okay to me. You don't have to leave a note, but I will do. Then here we've got Albert Verifying Angus, the approver, because these are approvers. But again, I'm just going to select myself. Again, you can multi-select first come, first served, or everybody has to approve it before it moves forward basis. But again, it says pending. But I don't have to wait for that pending. I didn't have to wait as the person who pushed it forward in the um, first place. I could have just carried on creating new sheets, working on my next Revit model, whatever I need to do. And as a checker, I could check something else or I could go and do another task. This is all being done in the background. It's not using my processor. It's not using and wasting my time. This is all being pushed off to the back end. So this time it's taking the DWG file, updating the title block for me to say for approval, generating me a PDF, and then sending an email to the approver once that task has been completed. Okay, so just give that a second in the background. There you go, so it's come now for, for, for approval. Now that it's for approval, the user follows the link in the email again, it takes them to the uh, document. So you just have to imagine now there's an email just come in. You just have to imagine I'm a different user, I'm the approver, on a different desk, a different machine, I've received my email, I've followed the link. So I come in, I go right click, workflow, review and approve. Hit next. So once you've got used to being involved in a very simple letter approval process or a very complex drawing issue, process. It doesn't really matter. Still right click workflow. You're always led by the hand and you can never do the wrong thing at the wrong time. You don't have to ask whether or not something's been done. Um, you can always look at the workflow history to see what stage a workflow is at. But you can see that it says for approval. But the other thing it's done is stamp the initials in of the checker. And we can stamp in date times as well. And if you've got multiple checkers and multiple verifiers, then we can stamp those in as well. And obviously you can always see the history of what's been done. So I hit next. Again, I'm going to accept this and hit next again and finish. And again, it's going to submit it to the back end workflow box. You don't have to submit it to the back end workflow box every time. You can just move the workflow through the stages, which is obviously quicker because it doesn't have to do any processing. But you wouldn't end up having the manipulation of the title block as it passed through the workflow. But you may choose that you just want it to just update at approved and put the word approved in there for you.
So once this is processed, you can now see that it's approved. Once this is approved, I can right click and we've now got another option, view attached. When I say view attached, I get to see the PDF as approved. Okay, so we've now got our approved drawing. So that's fine, we've internally approved that and we're happy with it, that's great. But now we've got to deliver that to our client. Now if I just show you here, BIM 360, you'll see this is our client's environment for today, BIM 360, and you can see that there are certain files already in there. If we to minimize that a second and go back to this, because what we want to do now is share this. So all we need to do is right click, workflow, and we're led by the hand again. Now, if you don't use all these statuses, we could obviously comment them out and configure them out so you only have the relevant ones that you use. But I'm just going to say S3 review and comment. But I want this to do a few things for me. What I want this to do is not touch this document. This is our work in progress document. If you've noticed, we've been working under work in progress this whole time. But we do have a shared area. Now, the shared area is where we keep our IP, i.e. what we've delivered to the client. Because if they disconnect us from their BIM 360 and then ask us what we delivered, we wouldn't have any copies of the files that we delivered up into their environment. So what we want to do is take a copy of this file. As you can see, it's now been shared for review and comment. It's still PO 101. It's still S0 because it's still WIP. But what we want it to do is take a copy of this file. We want it to update the copy to PO 1 and drop the minor version, change the status from S0 to S3 and change it from approved to for review and comment. And also place that copy along with the newly created PDF into our shared area. So it's a bit like having your issued folder where you keep copies of what you've issued to your clients and the date times. It's just that it's automated. So you can see it says S3, PO1, we've dropped the minor version and it says for review and comment. But more importantly, we go to BIM 360, we also did, as you can see, the 4th of December down here at 11.48, it also delivered it into our client's BIM 360, all in one action. And you can see it also renamed the file for us. So it's inserted the status and the version automatically into our client's environment. And we've delivered the PDF into their environment with the status and version matching, because like Gary mentioned earlier on, there's nothing worse than you spending hours uploading files into a client's environment with human intervention involved, where you've typed PO7, for example, and then they open up the drawing sheet and it says PO8. So the user, the client obviously looks at it and goes, well, which one is it? I'm going to reject everything. I've done one spot check out of the 300 files you uploaded and it was incorrect. It doesn't match the in metadata. So I'm going to reject all 300 and whose cost is it then to check them all? Now, that's quite time saving with one file. But if you imagine you've got 300 drawing sheets, what you don't want to have to do is open up 300 drawings, change 300 tire blocks, generate 300 PDFs, sit connect to the relevant cde and today it's a connects but for the next project it's a site and for the next project it's been 360. you don't have to be trained how to use all those applications what you want to do is use one system and just right click and deliver your output which is automatically generated into those environments the next step is the user comes back and says sorry the client comes back and says they're perfect absolutely perfect problem is they all say po1 S3, and they all say for review and comment. What I need them to say is CR, CO1, and construction record. But you've got 300 files to do. So you've just spent all that time doing 300 files to get them to that stage. Now you've got to do it all again to change all 300 title blocks, generate 300 PDFs, sit and upload. But also this time you can't just upload 300 files. You've got to revise the existing 300 files that are already in the system, the S3 ones. With your CR and CO ones. But again, you've got to take a copy of the file because we don't want to change this file. This is our shared copy as it was when we delivered it. <clears throat> it's our IP of what we delivered. So in the published area, we've now got a copy of what we've delivered that published along with the appropriate PDF. 
But more importantly, in BIM 360, as you can see, it's updating now. It's now CR, CO1, and version two. So we've used a proper versioning history of what we've uploaded to the client, but no user intervention has been required. So if we navigate into here, you can see that this document now says CR CO1 as constructed. So there's no human intervention, no errors that can be done there. And obviously we can do the same into SharePoint. We've got SharePoint examples. As you can see along the top, these are the um, common data environments that we can upload into. And we can do all that with the 3D models as well. So we can automatically generate your IFC files as they pass through the workflow. We can upload your IFC files directly into the common data environments along with the associated metadata. So we'll, just to recap, we've ensured you've got an approved fold structure, which everybody is using across all your projects. There's nobody creating temporary folders or miscellaneous folders. You're ensuring people are creating the right documents in the right folders. You're ensuring they're using the latest approved templates. We're ensuring we're using the naming convention that's relevant to that project. It doesn't have to be ISO 9650. It can be, you can run multiple naming conventions at the same time within the system. We're populating your tire blocks, we're taking out that admin work and we're updating your headers and footers, your office documents. And we're automatically generating the output. We're also leading the user by the hand through the relevant workflow for the relevant type of document. And then we're automatically delivering the output that we've generated into your client's common data environments along with the associated metadata, as well as keeping copies of what we delivered, date, time, and who to. Okay, hopefully that gives you a very quick introduction into the capabilities of OpenTree um, and the integration with other applications. Um, I'll just pass you over to Gary, who just uh, recap what we've been looking at today. So I believe I've That's got a great. presenter. Do you want me to make your presenter? Yeah, worth putting um, just back on the last slides, just to, to recap. Okay. I believe that's being done. Oh, Good, no. thank you. Uh, no, it hasn't. It's actually made Adrian Chilton presenter. That's the system we no, have here. That's okay. Not not to worry. Look, um, so hopefully we we've given you a nice insight into to Open Tree and going back to those three words um, that I want you all to take away. It's it's helping organisations with with compliance. It's helping organisations to have better visibility into their business, but more importantly, we're, we're helping with efficiency. You know, if we, and when we've run some of the ROI calculators that we've got on some, some customer examples, the numbers are quite frightening. Now, we always take them with a pinch of salt, but, you know, even if we can save an hour of your week, four hours of your, your month, what would that mean to your, your business? What would that mean, more importantly, to, to you? So um, as we come to conclude, I'd like to say thank you everybody for, for attending. We've had a really good turnout today, um, some, some big numbers for our year end webinar. Um, there's quite a few questions there as well. So we won't go through those now, but we will follow up with everybody um, with a thank you email. Um, and if you would like us to come to site and, and uh, present to your business um, and maybe identify some of those key value points for you, um, we would welcome the opportunity. We also said uh, everybody who has attended today is in with a chance to win an iPad. I have that sat on my desk and I will be doing um, a draw this afternoon. I'll pull a name out of a hat um, and we'll let you know shortly. <laughs> Um, and also there is a free scoping session for, for everybody. So if you would like to know what would be involved implementing a drawing and document control solution uh, like OpenTree within your business, then again, everybody has this so we can come in, understand your requirements, we can document them for you, give you a proposal that we can then pitch internally or, or you can present internally with a nice return on investment calculator. So again, I'd like to thank everybody and we will uh, be in touch shortly. Thanks very much. Thank you.